I will be starting in-person classes here in Asheville, North Carolina soon. If you would like to join and attend an in-person class here in Asheville, North Carolina, please click on the Silicon Dojo meetup link down below. <laughs> As you know, I am Eli, the computer guy. In today's class, we're going to learn about the OSI model. <laughs> Hey, wait, no, no, don't go, don't go, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's only me, it's only Eli, the computer guy, it's gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay, breathe in, breathe out, grab your inhaler, <sighs> okay, okay, it's gonna be fine. Yes, so anyways, in today's class, we are going to go over the OSI model, and I'm going to explain to you why you should not be scared of the OSI model. The OSI model is literally a tool I use every single day. From the moment I memorize the OSI model to today, I use it in every day of my technology professional life. This is an incredibly important tool tool that sadly, <laughs> you know, the way modern education is, uh, many students uh, basically, they end up memorizing the OSI model and then throwing it in their brain trash once they're done because they don't realize that the OSI model, this is, this is more about more than simply passing a test. This is actually about doing your job. So get ready as we dive into the OSI model and I try to explain this concept to you in a way that you too will be able to use this tool for the rest of your life as a technology professional. So the OSI model is one of the most important tools you will ever have in your toolbox as a technology professional. And the reason that the OSI model is such an important tool is because it tells you and the rest of the world exactly what is not your responsibility. That's right, when you become a technology professional, whether you're learning to code Python, whether you're learning to configure routers, whether you're doing the system administration or anything like that, one of the big problems is that people will come to you and ask you to do crap. That is definitely not part of your job description. And what the OSI model does really at the end of the day is it gives us a model to say, nope, that not my problem. And then we can walk away from it and we can feel pretty good and Hopefully we won't get fired for being a smart ass. No, but really what the OSI model is, is this is a conceptual model for how network communication is supposed to work. It was created by the International Organization for Standardization many, many decades ago. And basically what this is, is this is a mental model on how computers are supposed to communicate with each other. And why this is important is this is, allows people to to visualize in their mind all of the different components of network communication and then be able to divvy up those components of network communication uh, to different types of technology professionals so that they can build or maintain or solve problems on those different layers, right? When you go uh, and you use a network for any reason, whether you're doing voice over IP communication, whether you're sending emails, wh whether you're, you're watching a video like this online, there's a lot that goes into the communication process uh, to allow this to happen, right? Communi uh, computers uh, literally have to be able to find each other, right? Your host, your local host computer has to be able to find a server on that big internet, right? A connection between your local computer and that server has to be created. Uh, compression and encryption, that has to be done. There's a whole bunch of things uh, that have to work together for you to be able to get a product that actually functions on the network. And so what the OSI model allows you to do is it allows you to visualize these different layers of network communication and then basically dole out the task on who is responsible, right? So uh, layer one of the OSI model is called the physical layer. And this is literally the cabling. This is literally the network cable from that goes from point A to point B. So if a rat 
eats the network cable, you know, you're not gonna go and get your senior level developer to go run cable. You go, okay, call Blackbox or call whoever you deal with for cable to get a new cable run. Uh, the data link layer deals with switches, the transport layer or the network layer generally deals with routers. And so if you have a problem at the network or the data link layer, uh, basically you call your Cisco people or your networking people and say, hey, there's an issue with the switch or there's an issue with the router. When you deal with transport and session, uh, those many times are server issues. And so you can say, hey, server admin, you know, either for Windows or for Linux, uh, we're having a problem being able to connect to, you know, to the servers, you know, can you figure out the problem? And it, it goes on from there. And so that's the important thing with the OSI model is it divides up the different components of, of network communication so that you can better understand um, the, the, the problems that are going on and then be able to solve for those problems. So all this is, is this is a mental, this is a conceptual model on how network communication is supposed to work that allows you to divvy up well, basically all the components of network communication and have the proper person be able to work on those components. So let's take a look at the seven layers of the OSI model. One of the first things that we have to talk about when we talk about the seven layers of the OSI model is there is actually an eighth layer that we just kind of forget about when we talk about the OSI model, and that is the software that we're actually interacting with, right? So when the user sits down and they use Firefox or they use their web browser, when they sit down, they use their email client, their, their Skype client, anything like that, that is actually the software and that is not considered a layer of the OSI model. Uh, again, on the server side, you might be talking about the Exchange server, you might be talking about Apache or Nginx, TeamViewer server or something like that. The software on the server is also not within the OSI model, that's essentially one layer up. That's one thing that gets a lot of people confused because they look at all the, the, the seven layers and they're like, but where, where is the thing? that I'm used to interacting with in the layers. And it's like, well, <laughs> this is the technology world. <laughs> that's not part of this, right? Uh, again, this is one of the things that makes uh, trying to learn technology a bit frustrating and a bit difficult sometimes is because many times, even, even the things that you think you understand and you know, that's, that's kind of left out for when we're looking at things like models and all that kind of stuff. So the important thing to understand here when you're looking at the OSI model and the seven layers of the OSI model is if you have your client computer, right? Your client computer is gonna be communicating with the server and so the communication Communication has to go all the way through all the seven layers on your client computer, go over to the server, and then go up the seven layers on your server to get to that server software. So again, if you're trying to use an email client, right, Outlook will be installed on your computer. You have to go through all the seven layers on your computer, through the internet to the Exchange server, up through all the seven layers on the Exchange server to actually get to the Exchange server software in order to complete the communication. So when you're doing troubleshooting or anything else, realize the problem may, may not be on the computer you're physically in front of, it may be on the server, right? So you're a server administrator, the problem may not be on the server, it might be on the client. Or if you know you're a desktop uh, support technician, uh, the, the problem may, might not be on the client computer, it might be on the server. So when you think about the OSI model, don't just think about it from the, the standpoint of the computer that you're currently interacting with. It may be, again, the other person's problem. It's not my problem, it's a sysadmin's problem, really. I swear. But anyway, so when we take a look at this, again, we've got seven layers uh, of the OSI model. The application layer up at the top is layer number seven, and the physical layer down at the bottom is layer number one, right? So when we start uh, with uh, the top layer, the application layer, basically what the application layer does is it makes the data usable to the software. And again, so when we're dealing with a web browser or when you're dealing with an email, basically the application layer actually make sure all of the data is there in a form that your software can actually use. Or 
It's the first part of the process of trying to break up uh, the, the information uh, that's going to be sent uh, to, um, to the server or whatever else. Uh, basically, then you go down to layer six. Layer six is the presentation layer. So the presentation layer, this is the layer that deals with encry uh, encryption and compression. Uh, so in the modern world, this would be the layer that's dealing with SSL. So a secure socket layer. This is a form of encryption that's used on the internet nowadays for many things, everything from VPN to, to just being able to, uh, to connect to websites uh, that uses SSL. So that would be at the presentation layer. Uh, you also have compression. So one of the big things with networking is obviously if you can make data smaller, <laughs> It makes it you know, faster to send over the internet. Uh, so think about in the physical world, if you had a big package and essentially you were able to compress it, you were able to shrink it, so all everything is still there. You can just compress it down into a smaller thing. It makes it easier to send, right? Most likely it makes it less expensive to send. Same thing is true in the, in the networking world, right? If you can take a large file and compress it into a smaller file, it makes it easier to send around on the network or the internet. Uh, so you may have run into this with like say zip files, gzip files, uh, tarballs, uh, and then basic compression that's built into a lot of internet software right now. That would all be at the presentation layer. You then have a layer five. Oops, we have layer five. And layer five uh, is the session layer. So what the session layer is, is whenever two computers are communicating with each other, they open up a session. And so this uh, session is basically a single instance of when the computers are communicating and it allows them to basically continuously communicate without having to do things such as re-authenticate, right? So if you log into a web server, you put in your username, you put in your password, uh, that username and password essentially should last as long as the session is open with the server that you're communicating with. So with that session, you can have like a lot of variable values. Uh, if you've taken my PHP classes, uh, there's a session variable where your, your connection connection to the server that has PHP on it, you can actually have variable values just for that session itself. So basically it's an easy way to, to just dump variable values somewhere uh, so that you can re-access them if you need it. And then when the session is closed, uh, all of that information goes away and the, the user will have to recreate basically a new session and give their credentials or whatever else the next time. So the session layer, that's at layer five. Then we have the transport layer. So the transport layer is responsible for disassembling and reassembling data, right? So when you have that big video file, that three gig or that 10 gig video file, you don't actually send that whole darn thing over the internet. <laughs> it's not... It's not actually like you're sending a letter in the physical world, right? Basically, everything has to get subdivided into what's called packets and frames. Basically, the uh, that big file gets chopped into just a tremendous number of tiny bits of data, and that is what gets shipped over the network or over the internet. The transport layer is the layer that deals with basically chopping up all the data or reassembling the data on the other side. So when we Talk about TCP IP version four. Uh, this is transmission control, control protocol and the internet protocol, right? TCP IP is not actually a single uh, protocol, networking protocol. It's a protocol suite. And so TCP is actually at the transport layer. There's a process we'll talk about in a different class called windowing. And basically at the transport layer, uh, TCP is responsible for disassembling the files. Um, uh, and then basically reassembling the files on the other side. And there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff that goes along with that. We then go down to the network layer. So the network layer is layer uh, three, and this is basically the connection between different networks, right? So when you're going out to connect uh, to something on the internet, or you're going to connect through a router, uh, basically in order for that communication to occur, you have to go through the network layer. When we talk about TCP IP, this is the, the uh, IP layer uh, where the IP uh, protocol is used, and this is for IP 
IP addresses, subnet masks, routing, all of that kind of stuff, that actually works at layer three. So when we talk about routers, routers connect different networks. That is, that those are pieces of layer three equipment uh, and that uses IP out of the TCP IP suite. We then go down to layer two. Layer two is the data link layer. So this is where Mac addresses uh, are used. So Mac addresses are literally globally identifiable addresses on every single network card that is created. Uh, one of the things you have to think about is in the networking world, you need a way to be able to uniquely identify all of the different networking equipment so that the computers can actually communicate with each other. Um, how that's done is there's something called a MAC address. A MAC address is this big, long hexadecimal address. The first, first portion of the address is basically an identifier for the vendor that created that, that network uh, card. Uh, and the second part of the, the address is just a, basically like a serial number uh, for that card. And they come together uh, and that gives you a globally unique basically identifier uh, for all of your different networking equipment. Basically every single port essentially has its own MAC address. So at the layer two level is what's called the switch layer. layer. So basically switches, you Use this particular layer and that is how they figure out uh, what computers are uh, connected to which port on a switch and so that's the data link layer uh, beyond that then we go down to layer one and we have the physical layer the layer that that's responsible for 99.99999 percent of all networking problems if you want to seem smart if you want to be a new technician and you want to seem smart basically whenever there's a network problem you just look, you look at somebody very seriously and you say, you know what? I think this is a layer one problem. And at the end of the day, <laughs> you will probably be right 99.99% of the time. People are like, wow, this person knows they're networking. Every time there's a problem, they always know what layer the problem's at. And it's always going to be a layer one problem. Basically, the layer one is the actual physical connection of all the different computers. So when we talk about this, this is the Cat5 cable, the cable itself. This is the fiber cable, you know, that somebody sent a backhoe through. I've seen that way too many times. The coax cable, the whatever else. Basically, somebody unplugs the, the, uh, the network cable from the server. Ah, that's a layer one issue. Well, it's... <laughs> That's a more significant issue than a layer one issue, but, but for the OSI model, it's a layer one issue, right? And so these are the basic layers of, uh, of the OSI model. Again, what the application layer does is this puts the data into a usable format for the software. Presentation deals with encryption and compression. The session layer is responsible for the sessions between the, the client computer and the server. Transport layer disassembles and reassembles the data uh, that is basically received or being sent out from the computer. The network layer, this is how you actually connect to different networks, essentially a, how you're able to connect to the internet. Uh, this is uses the IP protocol. Again, the TCP IP addresses, the default gateways, that's all within the layer three. The data link layer, this is where you have the media access control, the MAC uh, addresses for all of your different devices. Uh, basically, this is the switch layer. It allows you to uniquely identify all the different devices that are on your network. And then you have the physical layer, and the physical layer is literally the cable that connects it all together which 99.99999% of the time, somebody unplugged. So now that we know the different layers of the OSI model, let's go through and just talk a little bit about what kind of devices or what kind of software uh, you would be looking at seeing at the different layers. All right, so if we start down at a good old layer one. Layer one is the easiest label layer. This is basically where you're gonna find your Cat5 cable, or if you're really fancy in the modern world, your Cat6 cable, right? Layer one is essentially your cabling. Uh, if somebody 
somebody unplugs a cable, if somebody puts a backhoe through a fiber line, if some if a, a patch panel is not properly connected to a switch within your server room, those are the types of things that are going to be dealt with at that physical layer. Then you go up to the data link layer. Again, this has the media access control, those MAC addresses, and the data link layer, this is going to be your switches. So whenever you have a switch, there is actually a MAC address table in the switch. So if you're dealing with modern switches, like anything built within the last 10 years, you should not have to worry about the MAC address tables. If for some reason you have a switch that's 20 years old and may still be kind of sort of doing its job, you might have to worry about the MAC address tables. Uh, basically within the switch, there, there's a table, right? And basically in that table, it says what ports on the switch have what MAC addresses associated with them. Um, so in a small office, right? If you have 12 ports on your switch or maybe even 48 ports on your switch, the MAC address table probably isn't going to be that big a deal. Uh, but if you got into a larger office where you have thousands of computers, you have something more like a core switch, uh, that MAC address table might become a very significant thing. And so basically at layer two, this is before you get to IP addresses. This is the basic connectivity uh, of your network. And so you may have some weird uh, problems there down at that data, uh, data link layer, uh, but that's your, your switches and things. You then get to your network layer, basically network layer, a layer three, this is where your routers are. So when you're communicating between different networks, so basically what that means is from your local computer up to the internet, you're going to be using layer three, it's going, you're going to be using the network layer, and this is where your routers are. So uh, the router is a default gateway when you do your IP address settings, and basically this says, if you cannot find a computer on the local network, go through the router, go through the default gateway to try to find whatever computer it is that you're trying to communicate with. Um, and so this is where all of your routers configurations would be. You then have the transport layer. So the transport layer, again, uh, when we talk about TCP uh, IP, this is the, the transmission control protocol layer, the TCP layer. Uh, and this is what actually uh, breaks apart uh, the files that are going to be sent and then reassembles uh, those files. Uh, so when you're talking about TCP, um, the issues you may be dealing with here is if you have bad network connections, you may have a lot of, of packets uh, that are dropped for some reason. So when you're sending uh, basically data from point A to point B, there might be a lot of data that gets dropped along the way. And so one of the questions there is, will you use something called TCP, which uses a connection, basically acknowledges uh, when, uh, when packets have been sent, or would you use a protocol UDP? We'll talk about UDP in a different class uh, that basically fires off uh, the, 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 the packets uh, to the receiving computer computer and doesn't worry about any kind of acknowledgement. That would be the type of thing you're dealing with at the, the, uh, the transport layer. You then get up to the session layer. Uh, so if you're dealing with the web world, the session layer is usually uh, controlled by your uh, web server, so Apache or Nginx. With session, you can say how many sessions uh, can be connected to one, uh, to a server at one time. So if you want to make sure that your server doesn't crash because it gets overloaded, you could set a session limit, right? For this web server, uh, it's kind of a crappy web server, so I don't want any more than 100 people to be able to connect to this particular server at one time, be able to cr connect 100 sessions. Now, there's a problem for the 101 and 102nd and 105th person because they won't be able to connect to the server, but that makes sure that the server uh, remains viable for the users that are actually interacting with it. Again, one of the things you have to be thinking about as a real technology professional is how would you prefer things to fail, right? I know a lot of people don't want to think about that. No, 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 Eli, Eli, I'm a real technology professional. Failure is not an option. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not an option. It's just going to happen. <laughs> It's always cute. You see those noobs, and I don't know, they're like, yeah, failure is not an option. You're like, no, no, you're right. It's not an option. It is all just going to fail. 
So basically, one of your responsibilities is this to decide how things fail. Many times, it is far preferable for things to completely fail for certain users than for things to kind of sort of fail for all of your users, right? So if you have way too many users connecting to the exact same web server, so there simply are not enough resources on the web server. The CPU isn't powerful enough, the RAM isn't powerful enough, the bandwidth isn't enough, whatever else. What's gonna happen is you're gonna start getting these weird intermittent problems and it's basically gonna piss off all of your users, right? They're gonna go, they're gonna log in, but it's not going to accept the login credentials or they log in and accepts them for like a minute and then they have to re-log in again or they send information and they don't receive the, the, the right response back. It can be a complete disaster, right? And so sometimes uh, what's, what's more valuable is to simply uh, set a limit, like a session limit, and to say, I know this server can deal with 100, 1,000, 10 uh, concurrent sessions and be fine, so we are going to limit the number of sessions, and then anybody who comes in that's above the, the limit that we've set will hard fail. There is no question, it fails, it's not working, and then they can call help desk and can say, oh, okay, I see some users are using the, the server fine. They're getting hard fails. That means it's a session limit issue. So that means I'm gonna go to the boss and basically beg for more RAM or a more powerful CPU. So basically that, that's, uh, that's what goes on with the session layer. Uh, also the session layer, uh, if you deal with, um, Oh, especially proprietary applications, possibly Microsoft, uh, many times um, software that you buy from small vendors. Uh, many times when you buy server uh, software from small vendors, uh, you actually have to purchase a software per session, per every person that's actually connected. Uh, so I had a client um, that had specialized software and they could only have four sessions that were open. They had paid for four sessions. So until you got up to four sessions, everything worked fine. You tried to do the fifth session and you got a hard fail. Um, that, that's the type of thing that uh, vendors can put into their software to say, hey, you know, you should upgrade, you know, your software or you should basically pay me more money for more sessions. Uh, that's the type of thing you'll deal with at the session layer. Again, the presentation layer, uh, that's where you'll be dealing with stuff, uh, especially on the internet, such as a SSL or your compression software. So nowadays, especially, you may have some kind of you know proprietary or special encryption or compression on your network with communications between your client devices uh, and the server. Uh, what that is, is you'd have to know. Uh, but basically, the, the normal thing you'd run into at the presentation layer at this point is basically the, the SSL and making sure your SSL is configured properly. And then the application layer. So this is where it gets a little confusing with <laughs> with uh, with computers is the app. I want to I want to make this clear. I want to make this clear. The application layer isn't really part of the software, except it kind of sort of is. Many times the the software that you're going to be using that that client, the Outlook client or the Skype client or whatever else, uh, the application layer is going to be kind of built into that software many times. And so again, the the application layer is that final layer that actually turns uh, the data into something that the application can use. And so a lot of times that will be up there, like I say, with the software, It'll be something that'll actually be built into the software. So if you're having some problems, generally it'll be troubleshooting the software. Uh, so that kind of gives you the idea of the different devices or, or the different software that'll be on the la layers. Again, physical layer, that's gonna be your cabling. Your data link layer, that is going to be your switch. The network layer, that is going to be your router. The transport layer, that's going to be your protocol, your TCP protocol or your UDP protocol. The session layer, that's essentially going to be the web server. Web server or whatever that proprietary server you're using is that allows a certain number of sessions. Presentation layer, that's most likely going to be your SSL at this point. And then your application layer, again, <laughs> application layer isn't part of the software, except it kind of sort of is part of the software. So if you take a test, if you take a test, the application layer is not the software that the user is using. Um, if you're actually troubleshooting equipment in the field, it's probably the software that the user is using. And that joke is a lot funnier if you've been in the field for a while. So now that we know the layers of the OSI model, and I've kind of talked about the equipment or the software that would be on the different layers, let's talk about the standard problems that we run into 
at these different layers. Again, to give you an idea of how the troubleshooting process works and kind of give you an idea of what to be looking for if you have issues on your network, right? Uh, so if we go down and we take a look at layer one, obviously the physical layer, where 99.9999999999% of all problems are going to be, those are your physical connections, right? So that is the actual uh, network cable that runs from the client computer into your networking closet, into your switch, out through the router, out the fiber line that goes to the internet, and that gets to the other side. Uh, so what problems do we see at the physical layer? The problems we see at the physical layer is that the users <laughs> unplug their network cable. Why? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I've just seen this so many times. I'm just saying, that, like, you have these workstations, and you have all these workstations, and they don't move. You're not supposed to screw with them. They just sit there. They do what they do. And then somebody calls, can't get on the network, and is the network cable unplugged? No, of course not. I literally, I literally had to hop on a plane once to plug in a network cable. Because, again, I was a regional support engineer. I was flying all over the country in order to fix problems, usually bigger problems than this. There was a problem with one of the, 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 the main computers. The people called me, they, they called me because they had the problem. I was like, okay, well, you know, is the network cable plugged in? Yes, of course it is. And then I ran them through all this other troubleshooting work. And then I went, okay, crap, I'm gonna have to call the travel department. I will be there in X number of hours. Literally had to fly to BWI Airport, had to hop on a plane, had to get off the airplane, had to go there. First thing I did was look at the back of the computer and the network cable was unplugged. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you wonder why sometimes as a technology professional, I'm not always smiling and happy, it's because sometimes you've literally flown halfway across the country Oh, to plug in a network cable. Uh, so issues that you could have is the network cable gets unplugged uh, for whatever reason. Uh, one of the big things too uh, is if you have a large office, um, not only do you have a switch that should connect all of your computers uh, to the network, but you'll have something called a patch panel. So what a patch panel is, is you do, you do more drops. So a drop is every single network connection in an office. You do more drops in an office than you necessarily have ports on a switch because basically um, users may want to move their computers around the office or plug in new printers or whatever just just you know normal business operations at an office but you don't want to have to buy that many ports for a switch so you may have a hundred drops in an office but only have a 24 port switch. So 24 networking devices can be connected to the network, but there's 100 drops. The patch panel basically connects those drops in the office to the switch. If, if your IT people are doing their jobs, which let's be honest, they probably aren't either. Basically, anytime one of those drops is not being used by a computer, it should be disconnected from the patch panel and the switch back in the server room. This is a security precaution because remember, any, uh, any network connection that a hacker is able to plug something into is a vulnerability on your network. And so a very common layer one issue is you have a user who plugs into a port on their wall, their computer doesn't work, they go, ah! And then you get the work order, you walk into the server room, you go, okay, that's uh, that's poor, that's uh, that's drop, you know, 99. Okay, 99 on the patch panel, 99, we'll put it to the switch and now it's connected, right? So that's the type of problem you'll deal with on the physical layer. On the data link layer, this is going to be your switch layer. So all those fancy Cisco switches, 12 port switches, 48 port switches, gig switches, 10 gig switches, whatever else, uh, basically layer two is where your switches reside. So layer two issues that you can have is with, uh, with switches, you can either have half duplex or full duplex communication. In the modern world, you should generally have full duplex communication. That's basically, uh, can, can devices communicate with each other at the same time? So when we talk about half duplex, half duplex in communication is kind of like a walkie talkie. Hello, are you there? 
Yes, I'm here. Great, can you do something? Right, that's half duplex. A uh, full duplex is actually a telephone call, right? Where, where you're talking and they're talking the exact same time. So when you look at the switch, you can have a half duplex configuration or full duplex communication. Half duplex actually mattered 20 years ago. <laughs> there was equipment back in the day that required a half duplex communication. I'm not sure what the hell you're using half duplex communication for anymore. But here's one thing with switches. They do auto configuration, right? Fancy stuff. So you can have uh, 10 100 gig switches. So basically it can either do 10 megabits per second or 100 megabits per second or a gigabit per second. Um, basically it can do those three different speeds and it will auto negotiate. It will try to figure out the most appropriate speed. Um, sometimes that just fails for some reason. Again, in the modern world, it should be better than it used to be. But again, if you have networking equipment that's 10 or 15 years old, auto negotiation might be garbage. Um, and so you can run into a problem where if you have your client computer and it's configured for a gigabit per second at full duplex and your server, something got screwed up uh, and it's it got auto configured to like half duplex at 10 megabits per second, uh, basically you can have issues where you know the the the, the speed the throughput uh, uh, of your network um is just dog crap just absolute garbage um and so those are the kind of issues that you can deal with at the data link layer um one of the big things with the data link layer is the mac address table again the, the media access uh, control uh, table. Uh, so every single network card they're going to be dealing with, it has its own unique MAC address. And so again, one of the big problems you can have uh, is if you have old network network equipment, you have an old switch, uh, basically its ability to, to go through that MAC address table might, might take a dump. It might not actually be able to work. So those are some of the issues that you might be dealing with at that layer too. Uh, when we go up to the network layer, uh, problems you can have with the network layer is most likely somebody fat finger or something when they were configuring DHCP. So DHCP is what dynamically gives IP addresses and IP address information to your client computers. Um, if you do something stupid and you uh, you screw up with the, the subnet mask or you screw up with the default gateway, basically you're sending all your computers to an IP address that doesn't exist, uh, that can be a problem that, that you have at the network layer. Uh, you can also have issues with if your routers are not configured properly. So at the network layer, uh, you may have multiple different routers. They're all communicating with each other, uh, trying to figure out the best route to get onto the internet or to connect with other servers or other networks. Uh, basically, you may just simply be having uh, IP address issues at that network layer. Uh, you get to uh, the transport layer, uh, basically again, TCP, uh, Transmission Control Protocol. Uh, the big problems you see with the transport layer is where you have... I don't know, wonky network connections. Uh, again, even now, even in the modern world, you may have really, really crappy network connections uh, where packets get dropped. Basically, when data is sent, some of the data gets there, some of the data doesn't. Now, when you're trying to send files, um, basically the most important thing is that you get the entire file. But sometimes when you're dealing with things like real-time communication, so real-time communication is like voice over IP or where you're basically doing video calls, that type of thing, it's not as important to get all of the information as it is to get the information in a timely manner, right? If you're having a, a call with somebody and the, they break up, up a little bit you don't want to hear what they said two seconds ago you just want that conversation to continue um, and so that's where you can have some problems at, at the transport layer with TCP and stuff. Uh, you then get to uh, the session layer. So the session layer, the big the big problem that I've seen with the session layer is essentially uh, with uh, clients where they have proprietary software. Again, they may be construction clients or interior design clients, whatever, gym clients or whatever else. They have some kind of like web-based or some, some other type of, of software where you have a client and a server. Uh, and many times there will simply be a certain number of sessions that 
are allowed. They purchased four sessions, and now they have five five people trying to log on at the exact same time, and that fifth person has a hard fail. Uh, one of the big big uh, problems you see with this is where essentially a, a user doesn't log out at the end of their shift. Uh, so you may have a company where there's multiple shifts throughout the day, right? So they have four four sessions available on their license. Uh, somebody is supposed to log out at the end of the day, but before they logged out, they got an emergency call, they forgot about it, whatever else. And so basically their computer goes to screen, locked screensaver mode, but the session that they had open is still open behind that screensaver. And so now you get a lot of people screaming. Uh, generally for that type of thing, you just have to restart the service on the server or possibly restart the server itself. Uh, that will basically kill that session. That's all, all the sessions that are currently open and allow people to, uh, to to be able to, to open the sessions. Again, that's the kind of thing you see there. And the presentation layer um, uh, with uh, encryption, again, that's generally nowadays we're dealing with things like SSL. Uh, one of the big things now though is we have a lot of users and a lot of businesses uh, that get, get super worried about security. And <laughs> nothing does more damage to a business network than people that are super worried about security but don't take the time and effort to actually learn how their security products work, right? So if you start adding, there, there's a lot of encryption out there. Again, when you start doing email encryption and all kinds of other encryption that's out there, uh, basically you can just add all this encryption to your communications. If it's not configured properly, everything can kind of go to hell. Uh, so the presentation layer, that, that's basically what you're dealing with. They, they got some new fancy security package that's supposed to make their communication <laughs> incredibly secure. Your communication will be 100% secure. Well, they didn't tell you. <laughs> It's, you won't be able to use your computers to communicate. So again, all the all the communication on computers that no longer function will be secure. Right, that's the kind of issue you can run into there. Uh, and then applications, again, all the different application issues that, that at the application layer, all the different kind of software issues that you can deal with. Again, normally when you're dealing with the application layer, that's kind of part of the software. Not really supposed to say that in the OSI model deal, but it is. Your Skype client, re, basically reinstall. Uninstall the software, reinstall the software, uh, that is most likely going to solve the problem. Um, and so those, those are a lot of the issues that you'll be dealing with with these different layers. And again, this is why the OSI model is important and it is useful for me as a technology professional. As again, when I sit down at a computer, it does not help me as a professional to say, computer broken, right? I actually have to fix something. I have to fix something. And there's a lot of stuff going on with the computer. It could be it could be the network card, it could be the cable, it could be this, it could be that, it could be the other thing. And so for me to be able to conceptually break down and try to understand where the problem is, that what that's what allows me to solve the problem. Um, I think about this with one of my offices way back in the day. So we had an office up north of Boston, right? And so the issue with that particular office is they were getting all kinds of wonky issues uh, with being able to connect back to our headquarters and being able to use the internet. Um, again, not hard fails. Hard fails are easy. If you have a hard fail, you know, it just fails, fails, that's fine. I can deal with a fail. This wasn't a fail. This was wonky, wonky. Uh, the internet would be slow sometimes. It would be fine other times. VPN, when, uh, when we had our salespeople trying to VPN back to the home office. Sometimes a VPN would be fine. Sometimes it would break up. It wouldn't work properly. It was all kinds of weird issues, right? So our headquarters, right? They had the big network equipment there. They had the network operations folks there and they troubleshot and they were like, we're fine. We're like, we got a hundred offices. 99 of them are communicating with us fine. We're fine, right? So I go in and I troubleshoot all the equipment. We replace the switch. We actually replace the switch. We replace the router to verify that they're known good. I go in there, troubleshoot the server. I troubleshoot this. I troubleshoot the other thing. And basically what I determined is that it was none of our internal equipment. It was like, I could say, I could say from uh, our AdTran, something called an AdTran, from our AdTran all the way to our client computers, the switch, the router, the servers, 
printers, everything worked perfectly. And so what I was able to do is I was able to go back to my boss and say, I know from the ad tran in, so basically from the modem in, that works perfectly. Uh, we, we've, we've dealt with this headquarters. Headquarters is awfully, obviously working perfectly. 99 offices are fine. It's not in their issue. So I know it's between the ad tran and headquarters. Again, not, not my responsibility. What is the most important thing as a technology professional? To know what is not your problem. So anyways, I handed that off to let somebody else figure that crap out. So say they then call the, uh, the, the internet provider, they go in, they do a lot of tedious troubleshooting, and very interestingly, what the problem, what we figured out the problem was, or they figured out the problem was, is that the cable, the cable that ran from our ad tran, from inside to our server room, out to the DMARC uh, for Verizon or whatever our telco was, the cable between there had gotten corroded over the years. So we had a cable that ran from the inside of the building out to whatever, our telco, uh, what's called the DMARC, basically where, where their communication uh, equipment is supposed to end. There was a cable and that cable ran under, uh, somebody had run it under our parking lot. What I didn't realize is that the parking lot flooded a couple of times a year. So again, this was uh, you know north of Boston. Uh, so they get a lot of snow. Uh, then in the spring, uh, things melt, um, and so that parking lot would just just get inundated with water multiple times a year. Uh, the cable that they had used to connect, you know, the office and that D mark uh, wasn't didn't apparently be wasn't apparently the proper you know underground cable that you were supposed to use. So over the years, water was able to seep into that cable and slowly corrode the cable, which then gave us our quirky problems. Because when you have a corroded cable, many times you don't get a hard fail, right? Somebody puts a backhoe through the cable, you're done, right? Until it's fixed, you're done. When your cable starts to get corroded, right? Well, things don't, things aren't necessarily as fast as they should be, but it seems fast enough. And then it starts raining and it gets, it gets wet. And then all of a sudden, then you start getting the drop packets and you have lots of lots of issues, right? But this is this is an example, again, of the physical layer being able to do troubleshooting to say, okay, I know what's my what, what is my responsibility. That's I know that's good to contact people again that you trust, hopefully that you trust, and they can say their side's good. And then basically what you're able to do is you're able to say, that's bad. That's bad. I don't even know what that is. When I say that, I don't know what that is. I just know that it's bad. Somebody fix that. That's not me, right? And that's the kind of valuable thing you get out of that OSI model is it, it's the mentality for troubleshooting. So finally, I know some people are gonna be like, but Eli, but Eli, what about the TCP IP model? I've heard the TCP IP model is far superior to the OSI model. Why are you teaching me this crappy OSI model? And the reason that I'm teaching you the crappy OSI model is I find that the OSI model is actually useful and the TCP IP model isn't so useful. But you know why a lot of people like the TCP IP model? It's because it has four layers. So therefore, when they test, it's a lot easier to remember four layers than it is to remember seven layers. And a lot of kids nowadays are more worried about passing tests rather than actually being able to do work. And that's its own rant. That's its own rant. So again, when we talk about the OSI model, important thing to understand is that this is simply a conceptual model, a way to think think about how network communication is supposed to occur. Since it's a conceptual model, there can be different conceptual models out there. One of the conceptual models is something called the TCP IP model. And again, it's a way of mentally thinking about how network communication is supposed to work. And you know, it's, it's fine, it exists. My problem with it though, is that I don't think it breaks down the, the communication to all of the different layers. Um, and so I just don't find it as useful. The big thing, um, uh, think, think one of the big things with the TCP IP model is the application layer, that, that top layer, layer number four. Basically, that 
that maps to the application layer, the presentation layer, and the session layer within the OSI model. Again, when I was talking about this before, these are different things. These are different things to troubleshoot. Uh, these are different things to work on when you're actually dealing with network communication. And so lumping all three of those layers into a single layer I just don't find to be a valuable thing. Again, we go down uh, to the network interface la layer. So the network interface layer is layer one of the TCP IP model that maps to the data link layer and that maps to the physical layer. Again, when I do troubleshooting the rest of it, I do honestly feel that the data link layer is separate than the physical layer. Switch problems are different than, than the physical cabling problems. And so lumping both of those layers into one assembly single layer is not useful for me. <laughs> and again, I, I know some people call me a boomer. Some people, I've been informed, I have gotten to the age that they're calling me a boomer. <laughs> again, to be clear, I'm not a boomer. To be clear, I'm not a boomer. But some people say that I am. But one of the things as a not boomer that I look at with tools or anything else in the technology world is basically what actually helps me solve my problems. It's not about taking the test, it's about actually doing the work. And that's when I look at these conceptual models, the OSI model I can actually use, and I do use essentially on a daily basis when I'm doing my troubleshooting and all that type of thing. When I look at the TCP IP model, Again, it's a lot easier for testing. Four, four layers is easier to remember than seven. I, I, look, I'll, I'll give the kids that. But it's not actually that useful for me. It's like, okay, I can, I can memorize that information and not have a useful model, useful tool. So that's just one of those things to consider. You may be different. The conceptual models that you decide to use may be, may be different. You may make up, you may invent your own conceptual model. The important thing, again, whether it's a TCP IP model, whether it's the OSI model, whether it's your invented model, is that this is a way for you to be able to mentally break apart uh, the problems you're, that you're dealing with with network communication or break apart the problems you're trying to solve with network communication uh, in order to be able to separate out the components so that you can either focus on what the problem is, again, if you're an individual troubleshooter, or that uh, if you're on a development team or something like that, you can separate the problems out so different people can work on the different projects that need to be completed so that you can have that full communication stack. So there you go, there you go. It wasn't so bad, was it? You didn't need your inhaler. You're still alive, you survived. The OSI model, again, it, it gets a bad rap, it gets a bad rap. And like so many things in the technology world and life at large, it's not the OSI model that's a problem. <laughs> it's just horrible to say, but it's your crappy instructor. <laughs> Your instructor is crap, not the OSI model. Again, the big problem that you see nowadays is that so many people get hyper-focused on passing tests. All they look at is the memorization component, how difficult it is to memorize things. And then they forget, no, there, there's actually a reason that you're learning this, right? It's not simply about passing a test. It's about being able to go out there and either build products or to be able to maintain products. And that's the real value of the OSI model. Once you get past the testing phase, again, just take the OSI model to heart so that when you go in and you're doing troubleshooting, you can just visualize very quickly try to sort through what you think the problem is. Okay, the ping is, you know, if, if I can ping, if I can ping, uh, that means the physical layer works, that means the data link layer works, and it means the network layer works. I know it's not those uh, those particular issues. Uh, if I'm on a web browser and I can get to CNN.com, but I can't get to the proprietary server software, I know that the application layer works, most likely the presentation works, uh, transport layer probably works. So there's probably something going on with a session layer or something, uh, most likely going on over at the server, right? This OSI model, it's so you can just walk in, very quickly analyze the situation, figure out exactly where you think the problem is, and then as a real technology professional say, it's not mine. Oh, I see, I see the problem here. I see, I see the session issue. 
see, I, I, I can see the, 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 the software is working on the computer and I can see I can ping so I can see the network and I can see the internet and everything. So that means there's a problem with the session layer and it's not my problem. <laughs> My problem. Call Bob. Call Bob. Bob. Bob is the person that deals with this. Um, you think that's a joke, but but it really is true. Again, remember, as a real technology professional, when you're closing tickets, uh, again, if you have work orders, if you're in a job that has work orders, one of the big things is basically getting work orders out of your queue. Most of the time, hopefully, you get work orders out of your queue by, by solving the problem. Right? That's what should be happening. But other times, the way to get work orders out of the queue is to transfer it to Bob. <laughs> Right? Do your troubleshooting and realize, okay, it's not my problem. Transfer it to somebody else. And then, you know, your stats are up and everything is good. Um, so, again, this is the kind of thing that actually makes the OSI model very valuable. Uh, normally, with final thoughts, I go through and I run through everything again. I feel like I've said all seven layers of the OSI model about 5,000 times at this point. So, I will not repeat myself. But with it, again, it's basic documentation. You can go, you can take a look at the different layers. And, uh, and again, think about, think about uh, how these layers work with the software that you're using. Think about how these layers work with, uh, uh, you know, whatever tools or whatever they're using and go from there. Uh, so with that, uh, as always, I enjoyed uh, teaching this class and look forward to seeing you in the next one.